subject, the Holy Spirit and our access to God. And I, let me tell you, I cannot talk about access to God without getting excited about what God has offered. I kind of got the spirit of Kenny Smith, and call it that. And, and Brother Robert, you're going to have to watch me because I can kind of go here and there. In fact, when I was in the fellowship in Joplin, I just about had to pay for a chandelier that I almost busted out. But that's part of... Uh, that's part of our excitement in the Lord. Our access to God. It's just an amazing access you have. You are living in amazing days. Days that the prophets longed to live in. Days that Adam would have loved to be in. Amazing days. God has opened himself up. There really are no limitations if you think about it from a certain way. God has opened himself and availed himself in an, in an incredible way. And that's what we want to talk about this morning when we think about our access to God. But let me tell you for a moment. About a couple of years ago, I was at a, a convention, a youth convention. It's amazing the way people have wound up such things in such, a, such an organized, such an incredible manner. It's amazing. If you look at it, it looks like it looks good. It looks like God's there. The music's going. You got the drums going. You got the guitar going. Everybody's singing. They're all wound up. They're excited. The guy gets up when he preaches. God, he says all these things. He's excited. He's pumped up. All these things are going on in the midst of the service. But there's one thing I've noticed, and I'm not I'm not privy to just make judgments. But one thing I noticed about this, God was missing, and I was bored because of it. It doesn't matter how exciting the service is. If God's not there, I'm bored. And that's the truth. That is the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. See, when we talk about access to God, it is more than just you've, you've gained access by prayer. And that is a big thing. That is a big thing. Now, if you look in the context, if you look in the context of my subjects found in Ephesians 2, you don't see an allusion to prayer there. There's no reference to prayer there, though I think prayer is involved there. But that's not the predominant thing of what he meant when he talked about when we're talking about access to God by one spirit. What we're talking about is God coming in you. I don't minimize prayer, but I'm saying there's there's more there. There's more that's involved. Well, by way of introduction, it's important to know as we talk about this to reflect over all time. Since we are like God, we do have the ability now to do this. Look over all time and to see that from the beginning you were made for the purpose of the dwelling of God. Now that's edifying to know. God made you. In fact, everybody, everybody has got a head start no matter what, heathen or what. God made them in his likeness from the very beginning. Look in Genesis 1.26 and you see this great conversation between the Godhead. Let us make man in our image. A lot more there than what it sounds like. Let us make man in our image. Which means that you have a peculiar capacity. You are peculiar people. You have a capacity that is unlike any other created thing that God made. Dwelling. Closeness. Affinity. That's what he's done. That's what he's done. God is not causing his spirit to dwell in dogs. God is not causing his spirit to dwell in animals and things like this. Man is the key. And man is the focus. Man's the focus. That's what we want to see. And more than that, we need to know, and it's good to know this, because it blesses me to know that God will not settle for a distant relationship. Eventually, people are going to have to press in or to be excluded. They have to press in to God. As Brother Given has said, God does not throw blessings out to the perimeter. If you're going to get the blessing, you're going to have to get where God is. And God wasn't dwelling in the outer court. He was in the holiest place. Amen. You have got to be close. And he said this of a people that he chose, a people that he chose, the nation of Israel. Well, how do you want to know what God... You want to know what God thinks about meetings, of people that are meeting together that aren't close to him? People that meet together in the name of the Lord, that don't have a heart for God? This is what he says. Amos 5, verse 21 through 23. I hate, can God hate? Yes, he can. I hate, I reject your festivals, 
nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies, which means that when you're trying to be solemn and godlike, he's rejecting that because there's no heart. And it goes on. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will... Now these are God-ordained offerings. I will not accept them. And I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Now listen to this. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. Now I wonder how many times in the present day, and I'm, again, I'm not privy to be critical and judgmental. I wonder how many times in the present day when we are so wound up, we know how everything's going to work. Boy, we got it all planned out to a T. We know how it's going, music's pumping, everything's just right. Where God is in the midst of the assembly saying, that is noise. And I've already pointed out why he said that. But let's look over in Isaiah 29, 13. Let's get a confirmation from the Lord. Then the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. I reject it for that reason. I made humanity for the purpose of closeness of close affiliation and I will not receive anything that's less than that. Amen. And that's the direction that we are all moving in. Look at this. One time a man came to the Lord, said, Lord, what is the great commandment? You remember what he said. He said, this is the great commandment, which means this. If you were to do all the 630 some odd commandments that he had in the Bible, and you didn't get this one right. It didn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter. This is the great commandment. That you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then later he talks about the strength. Now I think that covers everything, right? Now you have a threeness to you, right? You have the body, that covers strength. You have the soul, that covers the mind. And you have the deepest, most inner part of you, the spirit, the inner man, the heart. That covers everything. And you notice predominantly what he, what he said there. The heart. If you don't love God with all your heart, it doesn't make a difference what you do. It really doesn't. God won't receive it, and I'm glad he won't. I want to be close to him. I'm glad that he, re that he wouldn't receive when I was at a distance, and maybe I was kosher with that for a time, but he wasn't. I'm glad because he's drawn me in. He has drawn me in. You have been made for the purpose of his dwelling. You've been made for that purpose. You have. Amen. Now, you, this is really amazing. You remember when Jesus was tempted, led by the Spirit out of the temptation, and the devil came to him and said, hey, you can change these stones into bread. You remember Jesus' response? You remember his response? Man does not, he's not just talking about Christians, Man, humanity, does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. You are not independent. You are dependent vessels. You depend upon God. If God never spoke, we'd just die. It's just that simple. Now, the, the Israelites, they said, if God speaks, we die. I say, if God speaks, we live. Because that's the truth. Every, I'm not just talking about you, I'm not talking about just the people of God. Every man. In the end, when it's all said and done, people that die and people that live depend on who got God's word and who didn't. That is, that's the focus. You have been made. God crafted you for that purpose. He crafted you for that purpose. And, and we can say like the psalmist in Psalm 139, 14 to 16, I will give thanks to thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in thy book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Now he saw a lot, didn't he? He saw a lot. He saw that when God, when God came to man... He didn't just flippantly create man. When he came to man, it says he formed him 
from the dust. He breathed into him and he became a living spirit. He became a living man. You see, when God came to man, he said, this is going to be a slow thing. He says, this is something I will think a lot about. And I speak as a man here. Because I'm going to make him in my image. That's amazing. That is amazing to say the very least. Well, when it's all said and done, when it's all said and done, what's the goal? It's all, I'm glad the goal didn't stop in the Garden of Eden. Now, some, some religious circles talk as though this is where we want to go back to. The Garden of Eden. Can you imagine me giving this sermon with that kind of revelation that was in the beginning? There are some things we can know about that, but let me tell you, I am great, grateful to live in a day like this and talk about the access to God. Because there's a lot more said now than there was in the day of Adam. And you glad it didn't stop at the flood? Wouldn't that be awful? Some preachers preach that way, like the glory is for God to condemn people. Well, God doesn't even want to do that. Glad it didn't stop there. And it didn't even stop at the prophets. While well, the great revelation that they received didn't stop there. And it's not stopping with you. Look at Revelation. Revelation 21.3. This is the goal. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. That is the goal. And you've got the first fruits of it. Isn't it good? It is very, very good. That's the goal. And we don't need for any men to define eternal life because it's been defined. Right? Eternal life is not like me passing a baton to you. That's not what eternal life is. Some people talk this way. So eternal life was some kind of just possession. You possess it, but it's related to what Jesus said in that intensely personal prayer in John 17, verse 3. This is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. There's no such thing as eternal life apart from knowing God. Amen. That's what eternal life is. As Brother Gibbon has said before, eternal life is not like a mosquito bite. It's just kind of bites you and goes away. God didn't just come zap you and go away. It's related to your affiliation with him. That's living. That is life in God. And I love it. You have been made for that purpose, and that is going to be the end of what God is doing, at least as we see it now. Ephesians 2, 17 and 18 kind of brings us closer to my topic. I love that context because he says of you Gentiles that you were without hope and without God. You know how it focuses on God there? He doesn't just focus on a body of doctrine. He's not just focusing on a message. though. That's there. His focus is that you were far from the living God. Amen. But it's not over. Jesus preached. He preached to those who were far and to those who were near. Peace. Peace. Which means God and you can now come together. You can come together. That's what access is. Our access in one spirit to the Father boggles my mind just to say the least and I'm not trying to trivialize the subject it's just amazing subject well by the grace of God I'll open this up it's more that topic I love that topic I chose that topic because that's a wonderful topic there's more there than what it sounds like that's what I want to do is to expand if I can by the grace of God your understanding of what it means to have access to God. Like I said, it's more than a prayer. It's more than just a prayer. It is. And it's more than just getting something from God. You just go to the throne just to get something from Him, and I'm not against that at all. I'm just saying there's more there. There's more involved. And it's, it's more than just knowing something about God. It's more than that. Oh, it's deeper than that. Much, much deeper than that. It means participation with the divine nature. That's what that means, as Peter put it. Amen. What wonderful words to know that we can come into participation with the living God. Well, available access to God has reached its climax in the world by the indwelling spirit in these last days. What some people would call the messianic period. It means the time that Christ has ascended, he has given up his Holy Spirit, 
You have more available, and I do say available because not everybody's availing themselves of it. And far be it for the world, of course, to do us a favor by showing us what's available now. And even in these times, and I say the professed church, even in these times, the professed church has kind of, in a sense, betrayed what kind of access we have. The Gentiles as a whole, and I say this with humility, it seems to me that they've dropped the ball, dropped the ball of what it means to have access to God. Well, that's what we have. Access to God by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. A great chapter on faith. Men of faith who lived in a time where access to the Spirit was not available like what you have now. It's not available. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. I love this text. And all these, speaking of all those who had faith, we commend them for their faith. Because they didn't have as much as you have. But they did have faith. They did have faith. Having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. And I think there's more there than just the promises that we haven't received either. They're still to come. Okay? Listen on just a little further. Because God had provided something better for us. So that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. What does that mean? That those people carried God's word. They believed what God said, but they didn't receive what you are now receiving. They are not made perfect apart from you because really if you look at humanity as one person, just kind of look at it that way as on the, on the whole of history. Humanity was not complete in the day of Isaiah. What God had promised was amazing, but he had not even been availed of it like you have it now. It was not made complete without you. Okay? And you live in the very days, the very days, the indwelling spirit has come. I just want to, um, let's see, let me give you one more text that kind of affirms that idea. Because that's, that's a pretty broad idea. 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful search and inquiry. Now that's the favor of God for those folks. For those prophets who lived in the days of spiritual decadency, people didn't know God, people didn't want to know God, didn't have any idea what was going on, and God revealed to them that was going to change. And they were ministering to us by doing what they were doing in their time period. You don't have any idea, now, uh, you, you might. <laughs> you have any idea how you were going to minister to people when you were already gone? That's the truth, because there's a principle there. There's a principle there. But they, they, they knew. God let them know. And this, continue on. Seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven Things into which angels long to see. And by the way, the angels are here. And they are seeing and they are hearing the very truth of God and rejoicing in this profound thing that has now come about in your age. Boy, I want to get that across to you real well. You are living in the greatest time. Doesn't make a difference how much spiritual decadency there is maybe in your congregation. You are living in the greatest times, in my opinion, of any other time period because of the Holy Spirit's indwelling. It's amazing. It is amazing. And they were ministering to us way back there, longing for a time like this. And now they see it. Isaiah sees it now, doesn't he? Well, this is a great truth. The Holy Spirit and our access to God. And I'm just going to make one point. I have one point today. And that's just the way it is. The nature of the Holy Spirit's ministry is to make us one with the Father. That is His focus. That is the preeminent focus. In every one of the sermons that are going to be given, it all relates to having real access to God as though you could have hope without real access to God. As though you could understand God without access to God. That just can't happen. But it all relates to this access. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not trying to trivialize everybody else's topics. 
But that is, that is the overall writing purpose. Oneness, what does that mean? It means affinity. It means closeness. It means that you're one. It, can mean, it means what it says. It means you're one. Now, do you realize that Jesus, long ago when he was in the world, prayed for you? In an intensely personal prayer, which, by the way, if you ever come, upon, come upon two people that are talking, and it's in such an intense way you feel awkward and you stepped upon it, uh, that's how I feel when I, when I brush over to John 17. That was an intensely close and personal prayer between the Father and the Son. And aren't you glad the Spirit allowed us to have it? Amen. I am. Now, Jesus was praying for you. There are times, and I'm, again, I'm not, I don't try and by nature be critical of people. But when people say, I'm praying for you, I wonder, do they really have access to the throne? Because if they really don't, it does no good for them to pray for me. But when I know that Jesus prayed for me, he had access. He had access, real access to the throne. John 17, verses 19 through 21. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in the truth. I do not ask in behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. Quite a prayer, huh? That you could come into participation with the divine nature, and Jesus was making an advocacy to the Father when he was in the world about that. Because it was time. You have more concentrated revelation about the Holy Spirit in John 14 through 16 through 17 than you do throughout the whole New Testament. Just loaded because it was time. The time had come for the Holy Spirit to be revealed. And He has been revealed. Your amens are that proof. They are proof of that. Closeness and affinity. That's my point. The scriptural affirmations I want to give you about this, because this is a wide subject and I still am a man. Let me give you some, just some of these affirmations real quick that talk about this oneness and affinity you have with God. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. That's access. 1 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a harlot is one body with her? For he says the two will become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. That's the truth. Colossians 1, 26 and 27. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is God, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Now you'll have to forgive me when I interchange Christ and God, because I do believe that they are separate entities. But I also do believe when you try and go as a surgeon and try and make a cut between God the Father and the Son, you're going to mess up. Because they are that close. Okay? So when I speak interchangeably, I just want you to know that. Another one, 2 Peter 1, verses 2 and through 4. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge. I like that. True knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. For by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. That's access. That is access. Now let's get into this. There is a uniqueness about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that was not in the Old Covenant, that is now in the New Covenant. I'm not going to dwell extensively on this, but I, in fact, this whole sermon is kind of like a spider in water. It's just kind of an overview. But there is a very real sense there was something different about when the Spirit came in the time of the Old Covenant and when He came in the time of the New Covenant, and this is it. When He came in the Old Covenant, the predominant means for the Holy Spirit was to reveal a message. To reveal a message. Okay, that's where you see that all over. The Spirit came and revealed a message. Revealed a message. But in the New Covenant, something's a little different. 
He has come to reveal God. That's why he's come. To reveal God to you. Now, I'm not saying it's apart from the message, but you see where I'm going. You understand what I'm saying. Real access to God that was not there in the Old Covenant. That is there now. Okay? The uniqueness of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing. That is amazing. To disclose God to you. I love it. I'm glad he did that. And another thing. The Spirit is the appointed means of coming to the knowledge of God. The Spirit is the appointed means. As though you could come to the knowledge of God without the Holy Spirit. Well, you may get a little bit, but you may get what Solomon had. You know, but even he had the Spirit to get what he had. But there's, there's something different now, something greater. You have, to, you have to have the Spirit to come to God. To get to the, to the heart of God. To get to the knowledge that's available to you now. That's the truth. The Spirit. Look in Ezekiel 36, 26 through 28. It says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. And you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. Amen. Closeness, affinity. God is, now, now you know, you know that from the scriptures that God does not just associate his name anywhere. Not anywhere. But he puts himself on record here. You will be my people. You remember when the, when the Israelites were committing fornication on the mountain, well, God didn't own them at that time. Either those people are your people, but they weren't my people. He was going to kill those people. But here he goes on record, and it's by the Spirit, by this Holy Spirit that has now come, that you are his people, and he is your God. And this is also found in the New Covenant. Hebrews 8. 10 through 11, this is the trademark of the new covenant. Wherever this is not happening, there's just no new covenant for somebody. They're not in the new covenant if this is not what's happening. Now listen, Hebrews 8, 10 through 11 says, For this is the covenant that I will make, and this associates with what he, just, what he said in Ezekiel, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. Amen. That is a trademark of the new covenant. Amen. They all know him. So wherever you find that people don't know God, they aren't in the new covenant. Because from the least of them, when you first come in, God comes into you. It's not something to be accomplished way down the road. It happens at the, at the very beginning of salvation that he comes in you. So I have the Holy Spirit. Brother Given Blakely has the Holy Spirit. The youngest person here in Christ has the Holy Spirit. They all know God. Well, in other words, wherever you have to teach people to know God, well, you know what's going on there. Ephesians 1, 15 through 17, because I really want to clarify this. That the Spirit is the appointed means of the true knowledge of God. The Spirit is the appointed means. Ephesians 1, 15 through 17. Paul had some insight. And he prayed because of his heart for people. And you know what this is like if you are a preacher. If you are a pastor. And you know what this is like, those of you who aren't preachers and pastors. What is the, one of the greatest weighty things on you as a preacher? Do my people really know God? Do they really know Him? And for you, who are not a preacher, you have the same question. I want to really know Him. I don't want to put on an act. I tell my people, I don't put on an act. My excitement is not to, get, not to keep you from getting bored. I'm excited because I have real access to God. I don't put on a show. It's because I know Him. I can say like Paul, and so can you. We know whom we have believed. We know it, and we're convinced. We are convinced. 
Well, this is great prayer. I love it. Ephesians 1, 15 through 17. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him in the knowledge of him. If the people didn't have the Holy Spirit, there would be no true knowledge with God. That's why it was a burden to Paul. That's why it was a burden. Well, the minister doesn't carry the church. That's why he's got to get you connected to God. He's got to get you connected to God. That's the issue. Well, even more than that, it's, it's kind of like, as I was driving up here, I saw cornfields. and, and some of you folks that live in Indiana, you'll know about this. Iowa people know about this. And other people, you'll see what I'm talking about. You're driving beside a cornfield and you look over and everything looks in disarray. It looks unorganized. It seems like there's no symmetry, there's no rows, there's no anything. It just looks like a mass of confusion there. But then if you shift your angle to the other side, all of a sudden you see the rows. You see the rows and you see the symmetry. And you see the organization, and you can see how it all fits together. Do you remember being on the other side when it all looked in confusion? You read the Word of God, and it just looked like a conglomeration of things. You didn't have any idea how this fit together. But then the Holy Spirit came, and you got shifted to the other angle. And now you see how organized it is. It is truly organized. One example, Peter. Now, Peter, he suffers a lot of rap today, but let me tell you, he is... The rock, right? He's the rock. Well, Peter, in multiple different times, was rebuked by Jesus. Rebuked, I think, more sternly than others when at a point where he would hinder Christ from dying. He would hinder him. The very thing that was going to save Peter, he was, he was abused by Satan as an appointed means of, of hindering Jesus. And there was a temptation there, let me tell you. You can see by Jesus' passion in that. Get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me. You don't have in mind the things of God. And in other times, where Peter had, well, just a few times, just a couple of times, where he spoke out about things. Jesus was on the, on the mountain. He had availed himself. Can you imagine you waking up and seeing something like that? Seeing Jesus unveiled like that? Well, let me tell you. Peter saw Joel the way he'd never seen Joel before after the Holy Spirit came. And he led 3,000 people to the Lord in that glorious day. What an amazing event. And you know the difference. The blessed Holy Spirit has come. And he has given us an understanding. He has. Christ has done that in a thorough way. Well, at this point, it would be good to say there is a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. This is fundamentally important. It got, this has got to be known in a Western culture, in a Western mentality of people that say just because we got all the facts means we know God. And that is not true. That is not true. The Western culture emphasizes this. But this is, is uh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's limited. It is limited up here. I am not in any way minimizing the intellect because I will tell you this. Since I have come to a greater understanding of Christ, my intellect is very sharp. Sharper than it's ever been before. And that's because of Christ. But there is a very real sense. There is a very real sense that the mind can only go so far. It can only go so far in getting the things of God. True knowledge and just knowing. I really want to, to let this be known to you. I know about Brother Mike. And Brother Mike, you blessed me with your sermon about the angels. I just want you to know that. That was an amazing sermon. I know about him. And I have come to know him a little bit. But I know my wife. I know her. I know things about her that you don't know. And it's not because I sat in a classroom and learned about her. <laughs> I had real access. And I'm not against classroom setting at all. I'm not saying that. I'm not defaming the classroom setting. I'm just saying it's got to get beyond that. That has got to be a springboard for real access. You've got to have real, real knowledge. The true knowledge 
of God as the Spirit went out of the way to make sure that was there. The true, true knowledge of God. There is a difference. Now Christ and God abide in us through the Holy Spirit. That is a major, major point John makes. Major point. In fact, all my references on this are from John. Isn't that amazing? The man who was, in a way, closest to the Lord Jesus when he walked in the world. Christ and God abide in us through the Holy Spirit. Very important for the people to know that. That's a great subject to preach. John 14, 15 through 17. If you love me, you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not behold him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. Abiding with you, he will be in you. I want you to see a parallel, because he's going to go down to verse 23. And it says the same thing. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Amen. A very parallel. Well, that is, the, that is the mind of Christ right there. You see the parallel. Try and separate the Godhead you know, in a very intricate way. And it just can't be done because there's a oneness. There's a oneness there. Well, there is a parallel for this very reason, that if the Holy Spirit resides in you, you have the whole Godhead. They never work independent of one another. They've been working together from the beginning that we know. The very first record was God the Father, and the Spirit hovered over the water. And we know from other revelation that Jesus was there too. The Word. He was the Word, the spoken Word. The Godhead is in you. Through the Holy Spirit. I want you to see this. Now there's a principle about the Godhead that's found right in the same context. In John 14, verse 7 through 10. Personal confrontation with Philip. That took place here. Because Jesus makes a statement that appeals to faith. Right here. Okay. And Philip tries to get hold of it. But you imagine how hard it would be to get hold of something Jesus said without the Holy Spirit. Well, it would be very hard. And he says... If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. But God, but Jesus, God's not here. I don't see him. How can, how can you say that I know the Father? Well, you know how. You know how. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How you say, show us the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father? The Father is in me. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. You see that? The interchanging? It's amazing. If you have the Holy Spirit of God, you have God. If you have the Holy Spirit of God, you have Christ because he is called the Spirit of God and he's called the Spirit of Christ. You, can you imagine? You have the whole Godhead living in you. Well, that's, that boggles my mind. He does dwell in you. And John makes a very important point about this in 1 John. 1 John 3, 24 and the one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And we know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. That's how we know we have access to God the Father and the Son, by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. And he doesn't just say it there, he says it again in chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Now there's been a song put out that God is watching us. Watching us from a distance. And it sounds good, but then again it doesn't sound good. God watching me from a distance. Well God didn't just leave his creation when he first made it. Can you imagine that he'd leave you now? Yes. The very beginning he made it and he didn't just walk out, go away. He said he came through in the cold of the day. Enough said about that. 
He walks close with us and we know it by the Holy Spirit. God the Father, the Son, abide in you by the Holy Spirit. That's profound. That's profound. Well, this important principle also, this truth. God is spirit, therefore interaction with God will be limited if it is not on the spiritual level. It will be limited if it is not on the spiritual level. See, uh, and I don't claim for you. I'll say this, maybe where, this is where we were before we came into Christ. That there was a sense of, of an egocentric nature about us. It's as though we think God spoke the English language here. So this is the language God speaks. He speaks American. He speaks the English language. But that's not the, the language that God speaks. Not the predominant language He speaks. He has a spiritual language because He is a spiritual God. He has a spiritual message for spiritual people. And it comes by that spiritual messenger, the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have that, man, well, like what he said to Nicodemus. He said that if you don't have his spirit, you can't see his kingdom. You can't see the kingdom. He goes on to say, if you're not born of water and the spirit, you can't enter in to the kingdom. Now, the kingdom of God consists of people knowing God. Okay? If you don't have a spirit, you can't know God. You just can't know Him. But we're glad that we do have spiritual interaction with Him. And another principle that's in the Scriptures, it says God is spirit. Categorically. God is spirit. And the true worshipers must worship Him in spirit and truth. The true contention you know and I know is not between hymns and choruses. The true contention is are you alive in the spirit and does God's spirit reside in you? That is the contention about worship. That is the issue. Because if you are that, you will worship Him in truth and in the Spirit. In Spirit. And some people use that Spirit to talk about some subjective emotionalism kind of thing. And there may be a sense of involvement to that. I'm not going to be critical about that. But I say the Spirit is not just some subjective... And we've, we've seen this. Leon, you define this. You being a person. It's not being some nebulous Spirit that comes down and and slays you and then just kind of goes away and there's no real knowledge that takes place there. Oh, there's a sense and when he talks about worshiping in spirit and in truth, well, that's more than just an emotional thing that's going on there, right? In spirit and in truth, which means when you worship, there's a real connection on the spiritual level with your heart going out to God as you sing to Him and praise Him in truth, in truth. It is an advantage... And I don't say this flippantly, and I say this with all humility. It is an advantage that Christ left. It is an advantage to you that Christ left. Because there were things what he told the disciples. There are things which I want to open up to you, to disclose to you. But I can't. You can't receive that right now. And then it goes down later, but he, when the Holy Spirit, he comes, he'll guide you not into some truth. Not into 90% of the truth. He will guide you into all truth. All truth. The Holy Spirit. There was a limitation there. But when the Holy Spirit came, boy, you could receive things you couldn't get before. It is an advantage that Christ left. And he said it in John 16, verse 7. But I tell you the truth, it is, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. It is a clear advantage to you. Now you know the main focus of Jesus' ministry was not to get the people to understand everything about God. The main focus of his ministry was to preach the word, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, and to die for you. The understanding, Jesus even said it himself, greater works will you do. Because I go. Because I go. It is an advantage to you. If Christ were here just to try and explain things to you without the Holy Spirit, you could not get it. Could not get it. Well, we know that wasn't the main focus for him because he preached in parables. Except to those who wanted to know. I got a feeling that if other people would have come to him than just his disciples that were close to him, he would open up to them too. They really had a heart for it. Amen. See, but he did speak in parables, and that's, parables are not a means of opening up the truth. Parables are a means of disclosure. Amen. They hide the truth. You know this. Man, if you weren't raised knowing about the parables, if someone just said it to you and then just walked away, wait, you wouldn't even know God was even in that. See? Anyways, is an advantage to you that Christ 
left. So now the Holy Spirit is coming, guides you into truth you could not have known if it was just you and Jesus one on one without the Holy Spirit. Well, that's, that's amazing. And that's the way it's always been intended. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And that's the truth. Now I want you to see real quickly the superiority of attaining to all the riches. I love this. All the riches of complete understanding through the true knowledge of God. I love that. Well, that's, that's a lot there. More there than probably we see. The superiority of attaining to all that, as opposed to attaining to it through what I would call intellectualism, methodology, or emotionalism. And that all is shoved over into this category that I call soul religion. Where I think I've, I've probably heard it from someone else. That's probably not my original thought. Soul religion, which means the th dominant thrust of people's means of getting to God is through the very thing that God did and redeem. Through the soul. You uphold the mind. I can know God because my mind. That's how I can know Him. Is just through my mind. But we know that's not true. Soul religion. See, it's amazing that people think that way. You dwell in circles where you realize that's the predominant thing. It's the mind. The soul. But it's not even redeemed. So why would we want to depend upon that? But David knew this. Boy, his soul went down. He said, why so downcast, O oh my soul? Now, which was exhorting which there? <laughs> well, it was his heart that was exhorting his soul. Saying, catch up. Catch up. In fact, the mind, in some degrees, the mind is kind of like the caboose. Boy, the train's driving, your heart's driving in the Word of God. And boy, it takes a while for the caboose to finally catch up. That's the truth. Ever come to something in God you can't really explain, but you know it's there. And it came because of the revelation right here. So I'm not demeaning the mind when I talk about this. Because like I said before, since my heart has picked up the speed and the Lord has manifested himself to me, my mind is sharper than it's ever been. It's ever been. So you will become more mindful when you, when you emphasize the heart. And that's where you believe. That is where you believe. Not in the mind, in the heart. Confess with your mouth through the mind, but you believe in your heart. I understand it has to filter in your mind, and I know that. I know that it has to filter in your mind. But as, as some people have said, it's got to make an 18-inch transition to here. It's got to get here. If it doesn't get here, it won't open up. Because that's where Christ is. I thought that's, that's an amazing thought. Of all the places that Christ said He'd dwell, was not the body, was not the mind. Though there's a real sense of the renewing of the mind, but the place He dwells is in the heart. That's where He dwells. You've got to make that a thrust for you. A thrust. That's very important. And there's a superiority in attaining to these riches of complete understanding through the true knowledge of God as opposed to intellectualism. Boy, the riches of all these riches. Boy, how can we do that? We can have a seminar and just have all these different things and one day I'll come to a, a full understanding of that. But let me tell you, it can come right now. By the Spirit, you get the whole Godhead. A full riches of complete understanding right there. And now you get to spend the rest of your life picking up the speed on what's in you. And the Spirit will pick, you, will pick you up to speed. You'll see that. It's very important. When does the day dawn? When does the day dawn? When the morning star arises in your heart. When Christ comes to you like He said. He said to the disciples, and I'm not taking this out of context, but He said to the disciples, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. And He wasn't talking about when He's coming the second coming. He's talking about when He comes to you. On a personal level. Okay? I'm leaving you guys. I'm leaving my disciples, but I'm going to come to them. And he did at Pentecost. He came to them. When the, and uh, creation even tells you this. Try and drive at night with your headlights off. Wreck. Just a wreck. And see, that's what some spiritual circles, and the, the talkings about the things of God, you can see is a wreck. People driving out, out at night, they don't have light. Well, we talk about him because the day dawned and the morning star arised. Okay? I can see light because he's in me. Okay? We see his light in that sense. Because he has come to us. And that is superior to just an intellectual classroom setting trying to find out about God. You've got to have real affiliation with the living God to know him. To know him. To truly know him. That's important. Now, Brother Given has said this, and so I don't, I don't coin this. I coin what he said. 
God must be your template in reading the Bible. It is essential. God must be your template. You must put him over your eyes. You have to have him in you when you read his word. And he'll open it up. He'll open it up because he'll be with you, like you said. That's important. 2 Peter 1, 2 and 3 says this. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Which means you are completely adequate now because he lives in you. And he will give you everything you need because he lives in you. Because you have come to the true knowledge of God. When you come against an obstacle, well, you're his servant and he'll make sure that you stand. You need grace, you get it when you need it. And that's how it works. Through the true knowledge, see, everything, yes, everything. Everything pertaining to life and godliness. Everything you need to know to get eternal life. To have life when it's all said and done. When the battle's over, who's standing? When it's all said and done. To have life and to have godliness comes to the true knowledge. True knowledge of Him. It is superior in attaining to these riches of complete understanding to have true knowledge with God. True knowledge. And the Holy, I want you to see this, the Holy Spirit and His association with marriage, intimacy with God, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about intimacy with God. What does it mean to be one with God? Does it just mean that I agree with what He said? No, it's deeper than that. It's deeper than unity. Unity is involved, but we're talking about a unity that is associated with a relationship between a husband and a wife. I don't think it's any coincidence, and maybe I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, that's fine. So I, I tell you right now, this is my opinion. When Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as the helper, Parakletos, the one who will come alongside, come alongside, be with you. Sound familiar? Sounds very familiar. Go back to Genesis 2.18. Jesus had made man, but the woman had not come yet. And he made a profound judgment, as all God's judgments are. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper, a helper, suitable for him. That's why I like the way the New American associates that word with helper. See, because it caused me to look back, look back. And when God said, it's not good for a man to be alone, I'm not degrading marriage, but let me tell you, he had more in mind than just marriage. It's not good for a man to be alone. It's not good for him to be without the helper. It's not good for man to be without the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. That is marriage. And that is intimacy on a profound level. Now even more than that, in, in uh, Genesis 2, the same chapter in verse 24, he goes on to say, For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. One flesh. That is what they are. You are married today. You know this truth. You are one flesh. You are one flesh. And now you see, through that relationship, the intimacy that is there between the Spirit who is in you now. Through Jesus, your husband, and you, the bride. And the wedding through the Holy Spirit. I know it's yet to come. I know the wedding is yet to come, but in a very real sense, you have that now. You have that closeness right now. Right now. That's really profound. Now, in just a moment... In, uh, just the moment in, in Ephesians 5, 31 through 32, you remember Paul speaking about marriage. Saying how a husband ought to love his wife as his own body. All these things. In the midst of that, you might have thought the only thing it was in, we're, we're just in a marriage seminar. And we're in a marriage enrichment thing. And this is great. But then he takes a twist. And he says, this is a great mystery. This is a great mystery. But I'm speaking of the relationship between Christ and the church. Christ and the church. You are his bride. That is profound and it relates directly to marriage. The intimacy that's there. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 17 has a, runs along the same idea. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? What great reasoning for people that are being immoral, that are in Christ. This is great reasoning. Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? 
and most of them will tell you, no, I don't want to do that, that's what you're doing. Because you are wed to the Lord. Your members are His. You have become one, not in flesh, in spirit. And it's greater in spirit than it is in flesh. It's much greater. See? You become one. Well, if you give yourself to a harlot, you unite the members of Christ with a harlot. And then he goes on to say, a little further down the line, Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you're not your own? Well, where'd that come from? It means that the wedding took place when the Spirit came. The wedding took place when the Spirit came. Well, you get the 10%. We're waiting for the other 90. But you get the 10% now of that wedding. The Spirit, you, the man joined to the Lord is one Spirit, which means your spirit has been changed to become compatible with His Spirit. And they both give witness that you are God's child. They both do that. And that's amazing. That's intimacy. And that, that's enough said just about that. Um, I just want to leave you with this last word. This last word. And I want to leave this kind of open-ended because, uh, you know, true preaching obviously is going to require some kind of decision on your part. It's just, uh, that's the way it is. It requires it. One way or the other, it requires it. So let me leave this open-ended. We've been talking about the oneness, and I hope you've seen it. I kind of present it like a smorgasbord, but I hope you've seen it. The truth that's there. You can have more of the Godhead dwelling in you than probably you dare to imagine. That is the truth. That's the truth of God. I want, to see you, I want you to see that from a couple of scriptures. One is this. Jesus said God gives the Spirit without limit. Now I want to know what that means. Is that there are no fences in. It's not fencing me in. Once you, see they had limitations when the Spirit wasn't given. But now he gives it without limit. Says, opens up the door to God and God says, come. Says, feast. Is any of you hungry out there? You can have as much as you want. As much as you want. It's available to you. It's available to you. Boy, that's, that's without limit. You can know more than you think. And even more than that, Galatians 5, when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, which comes, by the way, because the Spirit's in you. That's why it's the fruit of the Spirit. Because the Spirit's in you. At the end of that list, he says, against such things, there's no law. There is no law. Which means that when someone has goodness, when someone has all those wonderful characteristics, we don't tell them, no, we only have so much. We only have so much of that. We've got to put a law on this. Well, that's using the law unlawfully because we know that using the law lawfully means using it for those who are breaking the law. So if you want to be like Christ, there's no breaking there. Boy, doors open, wide open. Spirit without limit, get as much of the Godhead as you want. Amen. That is the truth. This last thing. This last thing, and I'll leave you with this. Just taught a lesson here about the Good Shepherd, and He is the Good Shepherd. <laughs> That's why we're in Him, it's because He's good. He led us. Led us in His way. But the sheep at one time were pinned up. They were pinned up around. Wasn't much space to wander. Pinned up. But what does the good shepherd do? He says he gathers the sheep together. And I love this phrase. He leads them out. Out. Then they can find pasture where they can go in and out. You cannot dare to imagine how much of the Godhead you can get. But don't be uncomfortable with the liberality that God has opened up for you. Because he's not put any fences between here and heaven. You have real access.